Uh, sorry for the dramatic intro. Sometimes I can't help myself. Uh, what's up? I'm Skylar. Welcome to the morph tutorial. So I put together two different morphs for this tutorial. One is going to be this almost Terminator 2 style back to front. It has this almost liquidy, elastic-y kind of look to it. And the second one, which is more traditional style, I didn't have another face to actually morph into, but I thought it'd be funny to morph into in like an emo version of myself. So we've got these two kind of morphs that we're going to look into, explore a little bit. But before we do any of that, I want to answer the question, what is a morph? Because I think it's important to know at a very basic level what is happening with these kind of effects. And no, morphs don't have anything to do with shouting your favorite dinosaur. Thank you, Power Rangers. But yeah, so what a morph is, is it's a transition where a crossfade and a cross warp are happening through an animation. Um, I'm sure you've heard of a crossfade, but first let's dive into what a cross warp or distortion is. I kind of coined this term. If you have two different objects and you want one object to become the next object, you've got to be able to animate the shape from one object into the next object. So you've got this warp or distortion happening with the object to make it into the exact shape of the second object. But with the second object, you actually need to be able to animate that as well with a warp. And what you want to do is you want it to start in the shape of the first object and then warp back into the normal position. So really you've got two shapes that are warping and you want them to hold the same shape throughout the animation. That is what I'm talking about when I'd say cross warp uh, distortion. Uh, now with the cross fade, it's when you take an object and you fade it out at the same time that you're taking an object and you're fading it in. And you put those together and you've got a cross fade, hence the name. So when you put these together, this is a morph at its very basic level. And in theory, you could call it a morph right here and say it's good. But there's a lot more artistic decisions I think you should make to really make it look good. So before we get into the kind of technical part of it, I just want to share the number one takeaway that I had from making these morphs that will help your morph look better. And that observation is one that I call, don't show the crossfade. As we talked about earlier, the shape should really match each other throughout the transition. And as you can see here with the hand, there's a couple frames where the shapes are a bit off. That's when you can really see the crossfade. You can see the transition happening in a non-clean way. If you keep the shapes right on top of each other, a finger to a finger, a thumb to a thumb, you're going to get a much better looking morph. This goes doubly for the face. You should have eyes matching eyes, nose matching nose, lips matching lips, eyebrows matching eyebrows. I promise you the more time you can put into matching the shapes to minimize the look of the crossfade, the better your morph is going to look. Now let's talk real quick about setting up the shot. Now I prefer to shoot these morphs on a green screen. I shoot my clean plate. I do this all with a pop-up green screen right on the location where I want to have the background. This allows me to just match up the lighting as easily as possible so that it looks natural. All right, now onto the fun stuff, the actual editing. I'm real quickly going to go over a couple of the techniques that are just pretty automated. Uh, they don't always have the best results, but sometimes you can get something really good out of them. Like maybe you want to use the hair from one or the sweatshirt looks good, or maybe it does a really good job with like the nose or the mouth. You can then take these little pieces and you can kind of composite them in and use them to kind of save you some time. So the first thing that you can do is use the morph cut in Premiere. It's a tool that was originally used for people editing interviews, but you know, it actually works pretty well with morphs, hence the name morph cut. So we have our two shots right here. What I actually did was I just lined them up for the scale and position uh, by just dropping the opacity on the top one right here, made sure they, sure they were in the right position, really overlapping each other. And that's all you got to do there. And then you go to effects and you go to morph cut and you just drag it right on like it's a transition and then just, you know, scale it in to be however long you want. I would say, you know, half a second is probably pretty good. And it'll do the analyzing in the background. Uh, you'll see that I haven't actually done the key out of the green screen that can kind of mess with the morph cut. So I usually wait to do that afterwards, but it'll analyze in the background and in just a second, we'll have our finished result. All right, we can play this back. Just kind of go frame by frame. And you're gonna see it does a pretty interesting job. Yeah, it's, you know, honestly, I, it does a pretty good job with the hair. Sometimes it'll actually work better if no hair is kind of a part of the face the way it is with mine. 
Um, you know, if we wanted to, we could, we could use this for the hair part of it and uh, nothing else. So always good to do the most automated first and to see if there's anything that can kind of help give you a shortcut. All right, so the second most automated tool that we can use is the time warp. So I'm just gonna copy over our clips right here and just lay them over. And what I'm going to do is just delete out the morph cut, but I wanna use the same duration as the morph cut just in case we wanna combine both of them together. And all you really need for the time warp are the first frame of the transition and the last frame. So now that we have those selected, we can right click and go to replace with After Effects Composition. All right, you can see that it brought those two frames into a composition in After Effects. And at this point, let's just key out the green screens. I actually have a saved couple effects that I just want to speed things up with. And uh, now we take that frame, we're just gonna drag it right next to the other one. And at this point, just right click on both of those and we're gonna go to pre-compose, move all attributes in the new composition and have this selected, adjust composition duration to the time span of the selected layers, hit okay. Now we can right click this pre-comp, we're going to go to time, enable time remapping. And this is these are the steps that we need to take to get the time warp ready. So now we can bring the time warp down and see that it does a morph does a really fast morph and then it just kind of makes the makes the image disappear which isn't what we want so we want it to we want the morph to last for this whole 14 frames so we're going to adjust the speed i happen to know that it is set to 8 that'll get us to that 14 frame kind of mark and you can see that we've got a morph happening right here now you can adjust this particular effect by playing with the smoothness, the error threshold, things like that, the weights. But what I will say is that this particular effect doesn't do a great job of working on the outside parts of the object. Where it does a better job is on the inside. So working with the eyes, the nose, the mouth um, can work a lot better. So if you wanted to just use those kind of parts, you can click in and you can just create a mask around the face. Uh, we're gonna need to delete out the mask from Premiere Pro first. And it's a good idea to feather out the mask just for when we need to composite the face later on to the main image. And then we're just gonna copy the mask and we're gonna paste the mask right onto the layer below. And now we go back to our morph and it's just working on the face. This is where we wanna play with the error threshold, play around a little bit. And you can see that we can get a pretty decent looking little morph. Then when we look back in Premiere Pro, we can see that the time warp is working pretty well with the morph cut for a pretty decent effect. So now you can decide if you wanna use any of the pieces from these automated techniques into your actual morph, or if you just wanna use these two more manual techniques that I'm about to show you right now, that'll give you a lot more control over your morph. The Mesh Warp and the Liquify effects. These are the two best effects, in my opinion, for actually animating the change of shape from your first subject into your second subject, and vice versa. So first, let's go into the Mesh Warp. And you're gonna see that we've got rows and columns. You can get all the way up to 31 rows and 31 columns. And each one of these points is gonna give you control over the mesh of the object. So what you're going to do to actually animate the mesh is you're gonna click this stopwatch right here for distortion mesh, animate it over time. And what I really love about this particular effect is that it allows you to take whole body parts, like the whole hand, and be able to move them without really distorting it so you can tell, still tell that it's a hand. It makes for a very clean morph. So if we were to click all these points around the hand, we can then move the hand, and it holds its shape really well which is really great for, for a morph. Then we can click into some of these individual points and we can do the fine uh, details. You even get, when you get a little bit closer, 
these splines that will really help you manipulate the mesh for real fine details. So I really like using the mesh warp, especially when it comes to doing whole uh, body parts like hands, things like that, without really having to just worry about the distortion of those body parts. All right, so the liquify effect. Uh, when would you want to use that? Well, I like to use it in tandem with the uh, mesh warp tool. So you've got this kind of smudge warp tool. Um, you've got your brush size and brush pressure right here. You've got your stopwatch that you're going to want to click to actually animate the distortion right here. And I like to use it on objects that you don't have to worry about the, the actual distortion too much. Um, you can use it for the sweatshirt and kind of move that around to get it right into the correct shape. Great for outside edges, things like that. And, and all those little areas that the mesh warp tool really um, can't do the job for. What's also really great about this, in my opinion, is the ability to use something like the pucker tool. Uh, you know, to get that kind of liquidy, elastic-y kind of look for my face, I, I used it right here, clicked it a couple times, and it kind of just gives it that kind of squished in feel so that as I'm expanding a mask around my face, this is also animating and it's giving it this really cool liquidy morph look. So yeah, um, can be used as a bloat tool, all sorts of things. It get, you get a lot of uh, tools that really help with your own artistic take on what a morph should look like. And I really appreciate that about the liquify effect and is why you should really explore some of the tools that the liquify effect has. Really great for shrinking, you know, a zipper. If you just wanted to shrink the zipper down and make it look like it's appearing out of nowhere, you can use that pucker tool and you're going to see that it really just shrinks everything down. All sorts of great tools with the liquify effect. So these are the two that I highly recommend you use when it comes to animating the shape from one morph to the next. All right, so now's the point where it's time to do the work, you know? Just throw some headphones in, maybe listen to your favorite podcast, your favorite music, and just enjoy the process of creating a cool effect. And I do just want to say the reason why I don't want to show you just an exact step-by-step -step of what to do is because there are so many different scenarios where you might need to do something different. There's so many different ways to create an effect like this and showing you what a morph actually is and the concept behind it, and then showing you some of the techniques and tools that you can use, you can now be empowered to be able to make your own artistic decisions. And I think that's so important. And I mean, if you can see here at this point, I'm, I'm really just playing around with how I want the face to be able to start showing up on the back of my head. Do I want it to be uh, a mask that animates in do I want some warping? Uh, do I want it to start small or come around from the sides? And, you know, it's all part of that process of being able to experiment. You learn a lot from that. And if you're anything like me, you're probably going to be doing a lot of tinkering. And that's okay. This is the part where I was talking about compositing. And what I actually did for this morph is I took some of the morph cut, I took some of the time warp, and I used some of the more manual techniques. And I did piece by piece with different parts of the face. And I just kind of laid them on top of each other until the whole face was kind of coming together like a puzzle. And that's how I created that, so. Thanks for watching, everybody. Good luck on your morphs and, uh, you know, Hit that like button, helps with the algorithm, and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks.